Hi, welcome back to the Let It Matter blog series, um, Woman of Valor. I am here today with the rector from my church, uh, Church of the Annunciation here in Louisville. Her name is Mother Catherine. So, so thankful to have you here. If you want to introduce yourself and a little bit, a uh, little bit about you to the readers and watchers. Absolutely. Um, my name is Catherine Thompson. As it was said, I have been ordained in the Episcopal Church for almost 21 years now and have served uh, a number of churches, both here in the Dallas area and also in Louisiana. And, uh, and just so blessed to have met Kelly and to share in this ministry with her and looking forward to our conversation today. Yeah, so we are going to be talking about Priscilla, um, who we meet uh, first in Acts chapter 18. So this is post um, the ministry and the uh, death, burial, resurrection and ascension of Jesus. Um, and this is, you know, it's sort of we're into Paul's missionary journeys here and we, we first meet them. He has, um, Paul has left Athens. He goes into Corinth um, for context around this time. There had been a Roman governor who had dispersed the Jews, who had banned and exiled all Jews from Rome. Um, and so though Priscilla and Aquila are a Jewish couple, uh, they are not in Rome any longer because of the of the exile. So I'll just, um, I'm just going to read uh, a couple of verses through Acts 18. And then we'll get a little bit more context from scripture kind of as we go. Um, so this is Acts 18, verse 1. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they worked together by trade. They were tent makers. Every Sabbath, he would argue in the synagogue and would try to convince the Jews and the Greeks. Um, and then if we skip down, so Paul, it says, you know, in verse 18, after staying there for a considerable time, Paul said farewell to the believers and sailed for Syria accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. So he, I believe, had stayed there with them somewhere between 18 months and three years. He had stayed with them um, there in Corinth. And then they, the three of them, potentially more uh, picked up and, and left. They went to um, Centre and then landed in Ephesus, where uh, after Paul went on from Ephesus, Priscilla and Aquila ended up staying. Um, and then this is a really great interaction we have in Acts 18, starting in 24, now there came to Ephesus a man named Apollos, a native of Alexandria. He was an eloquent man, well-versed in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he had spoke with burning enthusiasm and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he only knew the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained the way of God to him more accurately. And when he wished to cross over to Achaia, the believers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. Um, and so that's, that's a majority of what we have on Priscilla in the book of Acts, just as a sort of historical recounting. Um, and then Paul has a, a really great sort of commendation of them in Romans, if you want to if you want to pick that up in Romans 16. Four. Four. Yeah. So he writes in Romans 16, three, greet, Pr greet Prisca, which is a nickname for Priscilla and Aquila who work with me in Christ Jesus and who risk their necks for my life to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Mm. So what an incredible commendation, right? I, I mean, really, Priscilla uh, was an amazing forerunner in terms of being one of Paul's early partners in ministry. Uh, she clearly had a very important role in his life and in the ongoing life of the churches in, uh, in Asia, because for her to not only be his partner in ministry in Corinth, where she opened her home and her business to him, they bonded, they found this common ground from which they wanted to minister. But then for her and her husband to choose to move to Ephesus, uh, Ephesus with him, start a home church there. And then later we hear they then moved to Rome 
and start another home church there to the extent that she then becomes one of the key leaders of the church, of the early church. I, there, I don't think there's any other way to look at that, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, especially in those three cities, um, very key cities on what is happening sort of on the ground with early first century Christianity. Um, if you Even if you just go the, the few words into verse five there in Romans 16, greet also the church in their house. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is not something that we're getting, you know, from church tradition. This is straight from scripture that we right. see um, we see them leading a church in their house in Rome. Um, at church tradition would have um, that they were likely martyred once they got back to Rome, um, maybe around the same time as, as Paul was. Um, but we see that they've obviously endured danger for him as well. So stuck out their necks for him. Um, right. In that and then, regard, uh, it's said that they are possibly his patrons. So not only were they giving him support in terms of his livelihood uh, and then enabling him to go on without them, thus probably becoming his patrons and using their status and their wealth to support him at a time when his life was threatened. I mean, really? Yeah, I mean, and we see that in Corinthians, we see it when he's addressing, you know, taking up collections to support missionaries. And so I, I think you're probably, that's a really insightful reading into that but that that if they're going to have a home church and they're going to be the ones staying they obviously having lived lives as missionaries recognize the cost um and the danger and the you know uncertainty uh, available to anyone who would pick up uh their cross and follow jesus into a life of itinerant ministry and so um man that's a really that is a really powerful reading of that. One thing I wanted to hopefully talk to you about um, with you specifically as a woman in ministry and um, doing the work of Jesus, I the language that Paul uses there in Romans, co-workers with me mm -hmm. in Christ Jesus. Um, and he doesn't say Aquila is the co-worker with me in Jesus and he's married to Priscilla. He says both of them. Right. Um, and in fact, I think in four of the six times mm -hmm. they're mentioned, is that right? Yep. She's Priscilla first. is mentioned first, right? And so that would either imply she's more prominent in his mind when she's writing it, or that she may be more prominent in their actual ministry. Um, and I think Aquila both are true. Is, I think both are true. Yeah. That, that would have been so contrary to the custom of the day that you cannot overlook that four out of six times she was mentioned first. Yeah. And it speaks to her importance in being one of his co-workers. You know, are the other two times in Acts, because that would have been Luke's writing. So it would have been that every time Paul addresses them. Oh, it's certainly every time Paul addresses them. Yes. Wow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that opens up a, a nice conversation there. I think that you wanted to, uh, yeah. wanted to touch on. Um, yeah, I do. I really do want to talk about Paul because I think in many ways he gets uh, the short end of the stick, really, um, because I think that words were attributed to him that are quite questionable as to whether or not they were actually his. And I just want to take a look at that. I want to take a look at 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 14, Good. where it is attributed to Paul yeah. that he said, uh, women should be silent in the churches for they are not permitted to speak, but should be subordinate as the law also says. For if there's anything they desire to know, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Now, the first thing I wanna say that uh, I, I truly believe is that you have to understand that these letters were written and rewritten over the course of time. And it can be argued that those words were added after Paul wrote the letter. And here's re the reason why we think that's true. Because if you look at the entire body of Paul's work, mm -hmm. he mentions women and their contribution to ministry a number of times. Not only that, but in this very letter, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, he says to greet Priscilla and Aquila and to commend them for their work that they're doing. So there, you have to use reason to, to think about uh, would Paul say that 
would Paul say those words, women should be silent in churches, if he were commending women for their work in the churches? It's completely contradictory. And wouldn't, I mean, I think in chapter 11, when he's talking, I think it's actually when he's talking about head coverings, but he says, you know, that women can pray and prophesy in the gathering yes. as long as their heads are covered is kind of how he says it, but it's, it's almost sort of a, a given, like right. of course they can do that as long as this is the case, which, you know, I don't think any of us would hold to requirement for head coverings or the inability for women to shave their head no. due to the nature of things. I mean, that's just not the nature of things for us here. And we also context. can't, we yeah. also can't forget that he was writing to a very specific situation in Corinth. There were conflicts in the church. Some think that those conflicts may have been caused by idle gossip or perhaps uh, false interpretation. He uh, speaks against speaking in tongues without an interpreter present. That could have been what he was referring to. There were a lot of specific instances in that church alone that were not addressed. Those instances were not addressed in other churches. So to take that particular verse and use it to become a law for all times to prohibit women from leadership roles in the church would be anathema to what Paul believed and how he operated in his actual ministry. I, I love that. And I, and I think the way that you said it is perfect is that we, yes, we use scripture as a source of authority, but that we also use reason um, yes. so that whenever you look at the body of Paul's work, um, I believe the Episcopal Church, and I think several other different streams in the in the um, sort of mainline Christianity would say reason is, uh, what is it, um, I think reason, experience, and scripture are sort of uh -huh. the, the three, um, the three the things three -legged that we consider, stool. Yeah. the three-legged stool that we yeah. consider authoritative, and then some would say, you know, scripture, yes, reason, and, uh, and experience in as much as they um, don't contradict scripture or something right. like that, but, but I really love that. That's how you, we're not going to, we don't need to spend time exegeting the original right. language, right? You just, and in fact, in the, in the NRSV, that's in, that's in parentheticals. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, we even have a note that, that verses 34 and 35 could have been after verse 40. And so there is a lot of, um, clearly a lot of question as to what was in the original, where, how was it really worded? Um, but you're exactly right. I mean, really just even in the same letter, the way that Paul commends the work of women in the ministry of the Lord and in, you know, whether, and, and Romans comes later, but whether he has experienced at that point more of the, um, the partnership. So this is something I've talked about a lot in this series is partnership versus patriarchy. Uh -huh. We don't have Aquila seeming to be very threatened we don't have him needing to prove some toxic masculinity to say you know no it's aquila and priscilla <laughs> you know um and we don't have paul mentioning her as a footnote we have uh -uh. paul holding them together in partnership and it's not that she's only validated by the presence of her husband because that's not what i want to talk about in this series either that women are fine without men and we women are the better of right. the two yeah. Um, it's that I do believe that God's kingdom moves forward and God's dream for humanity is partnership rather than patriarchy, even though the text was written in a time of, you know, obvious patriarchal culture, um, the household codes and things like that, that Paul um, repeats and speaks into are things everybody would have known, yeah. but he goes further with protections for women and slaves and children specifically. Mm -hmm. Um because so, I think he, he was operating under the model that you speak of, which is partnership. It was yeah. his greatest desire that an entire household, regardless of what brought you into that space, would become worshipers of Jesus Christ on the same footing with the same gifts, uh, all working together uh, to further the gospel message. I love that. I was speaking with um, Brady, who's a, a member also at our church before this, and she was saying, you know, I really hope she can address this in a way that's not just saying like, oh, the text isn't relevant to our lives today. And I said, I don't, of course, she's not going to do that. No. Um, but I said, I hope she can bring me around on him because he's kind of on my last nerve. And, <laughs> and while I, I do know logically those things, there's times that I just, when I'm just reading and I'm not engaging my brain, first of all, the, the way I was raised to read those verses for 25 years is the historical grammatical 
you know, method without any type of textual criticism to it. Right. <laughs> um, and, and I think a lot of us, you know, there's various kind of readership and, and um, viewership here on, on this blog. And so there will be some people who come from evangelical traditions that would say, yes, that's exactly how we would read it, is the right. historical, grammatical, hermeneutic. And, um, it and is I think it it's important to address it. that for the same reason that you and I spoke about briefly uh, before we started recording, which is that sometimes we internalize those messages, right? Even, even though there's some part of our brain that says that can't possibly be right. For any of us who have had a, a, a female teacher or even a male teacher for that matter, who had a tremendous impact on our life, not once did you ever stop and consider, wait a minute, but she's a woman. Um, it was about their gift for teaching. And if a woman has that gift, if a man has that gift, both are equal, both are relevant. I, I think we have to have both voices. In an ideal world, we would have men and women serving together side by side because our voices are so unique. Our experiences that we bring into the conversation are so unique. Um, and so not to, not to demean men or their place uh, in leadership, but, right. to say, but to say that we're both equal in that sense. Absolutely. And, and there is, you know, obviously the lopsidedness of clearly the men um, inhabit most of the space of early Christianity, the scriptures, um, and a lot of denominations now. And so it can feel like with, um, you know, Jesus feminism, if you will, it can feel like we're trying to say, throw out the men. Um, women are the only ones that we um, want to focus on. And that's not true. It's just an ethic that says when a woman is mentioned in scripture, we're not going to treat her like she is the anomaly. We're mm -hmm. not going to treat her like with Deborah, for example, we're not going to say like, oh, that's just because there were no men moving on. Right. That's an unfair and egregious reading of, <laughs> of a text. Um, and so same thing here, like God does not lack for resources. And so if God wanted only men doing this work, God would only equip and gift men to be doing this work. Um, right. But the great commission and the greatest commandment and the gifts of the spirit, none of those are gendered. Those are given to the church at large and not, and we have to think about this, it's half the church mm -hmm. is, would be left out of this if we, right. if we just kind of applied that same hermeneutic that says, well, it's in this. So whether it was in the original or not, I have to read it and follow it as if, you know, as if that same kind of hermeneutic is applied to head coverings or meat a sacrifice to idols mm -hmm. or um, observances of religious festivals and things like that. Um, so I'm really, I'm really thankful kind of for you bringing that up. Do you mind talking a little bit about sort of your experience? Obviously you mentioned Priscilla as sort of a forerunner. Mm -hmm. um, and so you clearly um, follow in the line of, of that, that, that pioneering spirit that she had. Um, and I, I would say benefit from, but just certainly um, belong to that community of women. So if you want to talk about your experience as a woman training for ministry and then doing the work. I, I, I want to say first and foremost that I really do stand on the shoulders of so many incredibly brave women who went before me. Now, women have been ordained um, in the Episcopal Church since the 19, or to the priesthood in the Episcopal Church since the 1970s. And so those Philadelphia 11, as they're known, the first 11 women who went against the tradition of the day and were irregularly ordained, as they say, because it was not permitted <laughs> at that time, um, really forged the way for all of us who came after. And here in the Dallas area, it was even later than that, uh, that the first woman uh, was ordained and certainly that the first woman was allowed to serve in a congregation. So I owe a huge debt of gratitude to all those women because by the time I came along, while there were people who had questions, who were genuinely curious, uh, most of whom who had just never experienced the ministry of a woman, um, I did not experience the type of uh, grinding, um, ex uh, um, just soul crushing, uh, feedback that those women had to go through, had to endure in order to get to where they were. So my process in the diocese was relatively very easy. There were 33 of us ordained to the diaconate and the priesthood when I was ordained um, in the year 2000. And many of those women are still my friends today. They were just really incredible about reaching back and supporting me in my own ministry. And, and I have been blessed to be a part of a congregation uh, 
part of congregations who have been very welcoming. You know, I, I've had people come up to me and say, um, you know, I'm just not sure. And my response is always just experience it and then we'll talk about it, mm -hmm. right? Because most often, more often than not, it's just the fact that they haven't experienced it. Right. So uh, then from my part, uh, moving forward, I always wanna make sure to be very supportive of men and women who are coming into ministry of doing my part to serve on diocesan um, and national uh, leadership roles so that we continue that tradition of uh, paving the way for the women who come after us and to help congregations move to the point where it is more comfortable uh, to have men and women um, serving side by side. I love that so much. Um, oftentimes in the written um, blog that I'll do, I. I try to find a way sort of at the end to say, let this woman's story sort of speak a better word to us today. And how do we, how can we apply this type of spirit? So like the five daughters of Zilophad, um, how do we, they are patron saints of economic justice for women. How can we, you know, mirror that? So I love what you just said though, because um, this might be a smaller group than we kind of think of. So I, as a, as a woman, with the deepest desire of my heart to pastor and to preach, but I don't have an undergrad degree, much less a seminary degree. I have a testimony uh, of a time when I was supposed to be in college and experienced significant trauma um, that the Lord, I believe, has you know healed me from and is healing me from and doing um, great work. So I can testify to that, um, but without the actual training, um, there's very few places um, in America, at least, um, that would honor um, or call someone in my situation. And I know a lot of women like that, um, that would say, I, I can't go back and take out another $100,000 worth of loans. Mm -hmm. um, and so what you said there specifically, when you said those women reached back to you, and then that's what you try to do and, you know, but it's it's a strategic thing, like you said, like serving on levels that is not just in your congregation's leadership, but on higher levels of of reach, so that when you do reach, you reach more. And I really, yeah. really love that. Yeah, because you know, I um, the beauty, the the highest compliment I think that I've been paid was the fact that there was a uh, a third grader who joined our congregation, and her church experience prior to that point was pretty limited. Um, but after only having been a part of our congregation for probably a month, six weeks at most, she went home and told her parents that she wanted to be ordained too. And that's the highest compliment. The fact that there are young girls who can look at me and say, I can do that. And not only can I do that, it's an <laughs> assumption, right? <laughs> that's so sweet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's what I strive for. I strive for those young people to be able, regardless of where they're headed, mm -hmm. I want all women and young men to mm -hmm. know that they have a place and that they can get there. Um, but it will take a very conscious act on our part to listen, um, to encourage, to be supportive. And I think if we're talking about Priscilla, that's what she did best, right? Mm -hmm. She took her vocation as a tent maker opened her home and said, while we do this together, let me tell you what I know. And, and you can't do that unless you have authentic relationships with the people among whom you serve, right? And so for me, it's about just continually reaching out, letting uh, young people know that this is within their reach and there are people who wanna help you and support you. They're not gonna laugh at you. They're not gonna dismiss you. They're not gonna demean you. Um, and that would apply to uh, all people, yeah. people of color, um, you know, the LGBTQ community. Uh, there, there's, there's a place for you, and and I want to help you find it. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is so so beautiful. And I was just thinking, as you said, that she's a tent maker. Like literally, her, even her. Um, her job is hospitality. She is uh -huh. literally making space, making homes. She's making room, um, even in her 
you know, just her work that allows her to do the other work she loves, which is kind of what I say about, <laughs> I always say that about my job. It's, it's a job, but the hours and the money and those kind of things allow me to do what I'm really passionate about, which is things like, you know, these conversations and working um, and writing on my website and, you know, a bunch of other stuff, but. And I think at its, at really its best, that. that's what ministry is. Ministry is mm -hmm. taking where you are and using it to the glory of God and to the benefit of all people. And so I tell people the most important thing you can do for yourself is to find your passion, whatever that is, and to pursue that passion in a way that makes the most sense. So you mentioned not being able to go back to school. That's a reality for a lot of people, but that does not diminish your ability to be a minister in the church. It enhances it because the one thing that the one thing that I was asked when I uh, was in seminary preparing to be ordained was what are you going to give up the minute you put on that collar? And I'll tell you the thing I give up are casual conversations. I cannot go into a room, like no one wants to have a beer with their priest. <laughs> it's just a reality, right? I can't go into a casual conversation without people knowing who I am, what mm. I do, why I'm there. It does affect every conversation I have. So for you, you have the freedom to go anywhere and everywhere, especially through your gift with technology, mm. which I will admit is not readily available to me. <laughs> um, but especially through the way that you've designed your ministry, mm. um, it almost enhances your credibility because you're not perceived as someone who is paid to say that. You're, oh. you're someone who says it from the heart and that matters so much to people you minister to. Oh my God, I, I could be <laughs> for days. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for saying that. And I, and I literally am hearing this with the ears of so many other women. I'm literally just names running through my mind right now. I can't wait for them to hear this. I can't wait for them to hear this. Um, that affirmation of, um, uh, some might call it the priesthood of all believers. It <laughs> is, it is it, the priesthood of all believers, yeah, um, right? We, we, we've each been given a unique voice and a unique place. We can't all stand in the same building, mm, right? Yeah. We have to be out. And, and if I'm doing my job, then I'm empowering others to go out and, and live their ministries in their contexts, whatever that looks like. Um, if I'm insisting that the only place and the only person you can hear the word of God is in church while I'm standing up in front, then I haven't done a very good job because it is the priesthood of all believers. In the Episcopal church in particular, the laity are mentioned first above priests, deacons, and bishops mm -hmm. as ministers of the church. And I, and I wholeheartedly believe that. Wow. And I do think that's a, that's a specific perspective that you bring as a woman, because for so oft, for so long, men, I think have, sorry, most of the men in my experience um, would say that bring a friend to church and hear my pastor speak um, or hear my pastor preach on this. But because you have had a seat pulled up to the table for you, like you said back in the, when it was the seventies, whenever mm -hmm. those did it. And then, you know, because you've experienced a seat being pulled up to the table for you, you're more, I feel like it seems like you're, you're more willing to say, okay, what is the rest of the table saying though? What are disabled folks saying? What are LGBTQ folks saying? People of color, yes. Yes. Um, whose voice is not represented here and how can we hear from them? Um, and I do think that's a specific type of perspective that comes with kind of your experience and the experience I would say paved the way for um, through, you know, Priscilla's work and Paul's affirmation of it. Um, so I, gosh, I'm gonna, we're, I think we've gone over, let's just see. <laughs> Who knows? I can't tell, but probably have. I just, uh, I'm so, so thankful for your wisdom, um, for your exegesis, for your, um, ugh, that generous, generous affirmation that you, um, gave just not just to me, but to any any woman, any man watching this, um, the the idea of partnership um, rather than patriarchy. And um, gosh, I'm so thankful and, that you're my rector. <laughs> oh, I, I'm so grateful for you, really, oh. <laughs> and and I'm grateful for the people who are taking the time to watch this series because it means that their hearts are longing for something that God wants to provide. And, uh, and, I'm, and I'm thankful for the time. I also want, I know you generally post information about your speakers, but I just wanna say that, um, you know, my email inbox is open. 
my, <laughs> my phone works. So call me, email me. Um, I have a, a, a passion for supporting other people in their ministries, wherever they are. And so um, if anyone would like to reach out, I'm available. She's also a tent maker, if you will. Thanks, <laughs> room. Um, I will link to that, though, in the post. Um, thank you for extending that invitation. Thank you for joining us. And um, guys, stay tuned for further conversations. Hopefully we can get Catherine back. Um, but, uh, but thanks for joining us today. All right, let me...